Welcome to the Music Reel. I'm your host, Nicola Burton, and today my guest moderator is Buzz Bidstrup. Hi, Buzz. How are you? Hi there. Lovely to be here, as Good always. Good to see you. And I've got John Pryor, who is the founder of the AIMA. So, John, nice to meet you. Hello. It's lovely that you're actually speaking to us today. Now, we wanted to talk to you about the AIMA. So let's start with, if you can introduce a little bit about how that came about and what your objectives are with it. I'd love to know more. Well, um, about eight years ago, I had an operation for a tumour. Up until that point, I was working, you know, around the clock on music all my life. Um, I became a single parent around that time. Um, and recovery, well, it, it took me a year or two to get, get back on the bike. Right. Um, and so I changed a lot of my attitudes to life. Around the same time, my, my brother developed a little bit of cancer and um, he did the same thing. He changed his whole lifestyle um, on the advice of doctors and uh, naturopaths and so forth. And he's actually overcome cancer uh, organically without any medicine or chemotherapy. Wow. So, um, you know, it happens as you get a little bit older. I was 52 then. I'll be 60 next week. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, you know, um, I've had such a wonderful musical career, um, but there are hiccups, you know, I don't always get paid for the big jobs. It's the biggest ones I have the biggest problems with. And that'll come back to APRA. And, um, I, uh, around that time I wrote to ACCC, uh, and put in submissions to APRA for the last time that their um, license to operate was renewed by ACCC. Of course, they're a uh, ruthless cartel monopoly, so they are under the watchful eye of ACCC. Right. Um, so a lot of things changed in my life, and around that time I started AMA. And um, it was sort of, um, you know, um, I'd spent so many hours in my own studio producing music. It's a bit of a lonely life, you know. So uh, that part of my career anyway, obviously I go out and play big stadiums and, you know, meet lots of people. But sitting at home so many hours in a row and with social media and all these problems on my mind, and I thought, do I really want to continue with a music career or do I want to fix the music industry first? So I've been trying to do that. And, of course, I've got Buckley's Chance. I'm just one guy, you know. But AIMA is, um, it's become a labour of love to help all the other musicians understand what's happening in our industry so that they can make uh, more informed choices. And that's basically all we do. I, I have a few bees in my bonnet about things in my career and I tend to harp on about those. And uh, my uh, fellow admin of the website is a guy called Peter Prize who is a wonderfully wise and funny man. Um, so all the things I'm not. Um, and the two of us have a lot of fun uh, with AMA because I can sort of go on quite seriously about issues um, to the nth degree. And Peter can come along and make light of it in a really great way that helps people understand and doesn't make me seem like a, a crazy obsessed person, even though I am. I'm <laughs> Hey, join join the club. We're all we're all card carriers of that group. So it's <laughs> it's the Australian Independent Musicians Association. So that's where AMA is. Okay, great. So now, Buzz, I think you've got a question. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of along along that um, the the Australian Music Plan that that you submitted. Um, what's the objective of that? Because I think people would be really interested in that. Oh, thank you, Buzz. Um, over the years in AMA, we, we keep saying, you know, what would you do to reform the music industry? It's sort of a common thread. Um, when that gets a bit thin, we say, what's your favourite guitar colour? And they're always the, <laughs> <laughs> the most popular posts, you know. But, but um, um, so a lot of people have suggested some really great ideas for the industry. Sean Wayland, who's a friend of mine, is a wonderful jazz piano uh, player based in, and band leader based in New York. Uh, he often comes back to Australia to do uh, uh, with uh, grants and he will, you know, produce a whole bunch of artists, the Conservatory of Music or something like that. Um, anyway, he suggested, wouldn't it be great to have, um, to archive all Australian music and to make it all available in one spot? And, and that, that's the idea of um, the national playlist. 
And then someone else came along. Um, we've been talking with a lady called, uh, uh, who's become a very uh, important part of our group, called Anita Monk, uh -huh. um, down in Melbourne. And she's uh, a musician and also um, not only runs her own community radio show, but produces a number of others. And of course, community radio is very popular in Melbourne. So I'm losing my train of thought. What, what was I trying to answer? Well, it's, the, um, it, it, it's really about, you know, the, the plan. Who did you submit it to? I mean... We haven't yet. Um, oh, okay. I, I apologise to all of our members that it's just taken a few weeks longer than we thought because we have a little bit of a committee process. And when one guy's busy, it's just all delayed. We're all just doing it in our spare time. So yep. um, uh, trying to represent musicians on a professional level, but there's no money and we're all struggling yep. with yep. now because the music industry is so difficult. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, the, the, the quickest way is um, the Australian Music Plan is a series of reforms proposed over the years that I have developed further along with our team. Um, our team, we have a... Uh, when, when we started AIMA, we realised we would never have any authority and people would always struggle to take us seriously because it's open to the general public. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not a fee-paying union or anything like that. So basically, while we're uh, building a stronger membership base within the group, there's thousands of people who are probably just music fans who come in for a bit of fun and hang out with some musos, you know. So when we start talking about the real issues in the music industry, they're often not very helpful because they just don't understand what we go through. Yeah. And so, um, but anyway, we've developed this plan. We've got a wonderful, oh, that's what I was saying, is that uh, we um, realised that AMA would always struggle to be taken seriously. So we set up another association in tandem, which is called the Association of Australian Musicians. Right. And that is a committee of seven people. And those seven people include uh, Bob Spencer, a wonderful guitar player, played with the Angels and uh, Buzz a times. Wonderful man, a brilliant guitar player. Sean Wayland, who I mentioned. Uh, we have Tim Williams, who's a drummer and a lawyer, and he is uh, he teaches law at the University of Western New South Wales. He and I develop all the policy from all the input we get from everyone else. Uh, I tend to make it a little bit more like a story. Uh, Tim is more efficient with the legalities. Um, and so that's the process. The Australian Music Plan is an attempt to revive the whole industry, but not from the top down with the corporates. We're trying to just cut those assholes. Am I allowed to say assholes? You can say whatever you need to say, John. Okay. <laughs> right then. And we just want to cut those assholes out of our part of the industry. We don't want to hurt them. They've got a great business thriving. They control commercial radio. Well, can't we put more effort into helping community radio get up and running? Mm -hmm. And so a number of our uh, reforms, for example, include community radio in an attempt to help right. make them stronger so that they can help make us stronger. Right. For example, we've proposed the national um, playlist, which I was talking about earlier, Hmm. Which was Sean's idea. And the idea was, what if community radio used this list of Australian artists? Okay. And they could tick the artists that they like. If they discover, in, and the other DJs can see that, um, maybe there might be an agreement that we can come to with community radio whereby a certain percentage of their playlist comes off this national Australian list. So that they're always sure. because community radio are the biggest supporters of independent music in the country, without a doubt. Yeah. Forty-eight percent, apparently, um, of the music they play online is uh, Australian music, and I would guess way more than half of that is independent music. Mm. Problem for musos is you don't get much royalties from community radio. You might get a cent, you know, for a song, or half a cent. Whereas if a song is played on commercial radio, you might mm. get five or, or six dollars. Big, big difference in income. Yeah, okay. and, and, and the other thing is commercial radio is all connected through the majors. They all source their material from the same three companies. Um, and they're all closely watching each other with national charts and so forth. They have a really great infrastructure. Yeah. Well, we need that. We need the charts. We need the okay. website. We need the touring circuit. We need the playlist. We need to archive the music. We need to um, 
and, and, and that's one side of it. Um, the, the other side of it is um, we've focused in on a number of community music projects um, whereby we would um, hire musicians and especially music teachers all over the country and put them into communities. Where do we get the money? Well, we're asking the federal government for seed funding. We've okay. asked, yeah, we're going to be asking for $5 million, which is enough for us to run to employ a team of musicians who have those additional skills that we need, which is our approach with the committee of the um, Association of Australian Musicians. Yep. One guy's a lawyer. One guy uh, was Australian Marketer of the Year for two years. He's currently the International Marketing Director of Deloitte, you know. Uh, and we've also got a music industry accountant. Um, so we've, okay. got all the, we've got all that, those sort of skills that we need. and. That's the idea of building a bigger team to actually run this Australian music plan. I've been speaking to a guy who is worth more than all of us and our friends put together will earn in our lifetimes. And he's very interested in either publishing or royalty collection to compete with APRA. Apra, am I talking too much? Because I'll just no, keep no, no, no. This is very I interesting. We'll talk all day and all night, but no, I'll no. We we want to know about it, John. This is great. Okay. Um, A Triple C has just released their latest today. Yeah. Um, Apra, which I mentioned before, is a cartel monopoly. So um, Apra has to make sure that it's operating fairly for all the stakeholders, and the stakeholders are obviously the composers. Some of the composers sign with publishers, so they're involved. APRA administration, of course. Um, they have lives too, apparently. Um, and, of course, the licensees. And licensees are the big ones like the Australian Hotels Association, RCA, is, uh, sorry, CRA is Commercial Radio Australia. Yes. Uh, the ABC, for example. And I've dealt with a lot of these people being a member of the APRA Dispute Resolution Committee, so I've actually heard all of their problems. I've uh -huh. spent time trying to think of solutions and so forth. Um, the way I see it is we're all in this industry together. I'm a very uh, democratic sort of guy. You know, I um, love making decisions by myself, but I don't like to have to justify it later, so I like to get everybody else involved. Um, and uh, so anyway, ACCC's rulings just come out and... They talk about, um, you know, competition. They, they, they try to keep some sort of sense of competition in what happens with APRA because basically the international publishers control it um, in every way. And when you control collecting the money, you also control distributing it. So they change the rules so that most of that money goes through to, um, to the major publishers and therefore it goes overseas. We don't even know if they pay tax on it. They're just using our country to... Have I dropped out? No, no, you're there. You're all good. Yeah, you're man. You're good. I've, lost, I've lost my picture, but I'll keep talking. Yeah, you keep talking. We can see you. Um, so, so that's where we're at. We're just finishing the submission to the government. Um, we don't want to say... I mean, it's not our intention to um, in any way um, make things more difficult for the majors and APRA and all of that. We're, you know, they've got their business. That's great. But what about the 100,000 independent Australian musicians? That's our concern. Yes. Everything I do in AMA, personally, and a lot of our membership is starting to understand this, is that we have to sort of talk about things in a way that involves everybody. Um, we talk about some reforms and all the musos who are, you know, like copyright reform and APRA reform and so forth. And all the musos who just play live gigs go, what does that mean to me? I don't, exactly. I don't get a benefit out of that. Yeah, and and so and so our our Australian music plan is basically based around that co the community music projects. We want to start right. community choirs, community orchestras. We want to provide top mentors who have experience in arrangement and production. We pay them so that maybe ten thousand musicians might be employed for an extra day a week in Australia yeah. to do this. We get some money from the government. I've uh, been teaching music um, at Dulwich Hill High School every week. Um, I love that job. The kids are bright. They love music. They run into the room. They're so excited to get going. I've done it in a very um, uh, informal way. 
where I ask them what they want to do and then I fill in the gaps. And we've ended up producing a couple of them, uh, writing and producing some really, really great stuff that everybody loves. The school hall is packed when the band plays there. Buzz. No, I was just going to say that w w what, uh, when you mentioned the teaching uh, with kids these days, you know, do you notice that they, you remember what you were like when you first started playing, right? You know, that, that need to play. Are yeah. they like that? They really are. They really are. Yeah, and they're at the age I really got the bug. I started playing guitar when I was seven, drums when I was 11. Yeah. And by the time I was wow. 12, mate, I was just on fire, you know. 16, I was playing with Stevie Wright. 18, I formed Matt Finish, and, and, wow. and my career's just led on from that. Yeah, know? yeah. But, you know, the thing about kids today, you know, you, you, they, they, they obviously must be aware. I mean, kids, say, are 15 or so. Are these younger kids you teach? Um, most or, of or, them are 12 to 15. Yeah, okay. So, you know, they must be aware that, uh, that the actual uh, the thing about the the earning capacity of being a musician, they must know that it's kind of, you know, not like it was in our day um, and the small return of it, but people still want to do it. It's just interesting to know what drives people to do it. It's the love of music, Buzz, as you know yourself. You know, it's just every, almost every human on the planet loves music because it entertains the mind. It, mm. it, it increases IQ by an average of seven. Learning a musical instrument increases IQ by an average seven points. Yeah. It increases memory and language skills by an average of 16 points. Music is fundamental to who we are as humans. It's, it involves everything that there is in being human. It involves our eyes, our teeth, our hair, our shirt. It involves our um, smile, our hate and our anger. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's ecology, it's diplomacy, it's politics, it's religion, it's feelings. You may notice, Buzz, I, I get a bit uh, itchy when everybody talks about music only being about feelings. Yeah. yeah. As soon as I say anything, they go, oh, don't you feel music? And it's like, oh, come on, guys, you know, it's more than that. It's yeah. more than that. It's ambition. It's self-identity. And a lot of people don't realise that, is that music, I would say, is 70% self-identity for most people. They will listen to any old crap as long as all their mates yeah. are listening to it. Yeah, 100%. And I would like to change Part that. of the tribe, the tribe mentality, you know. Uh, I don't want to yeah. stop it because it's a wonderful, natural human thing, but I just want to change it so it's not the only definition of music. Mm. Um, and isn't it interesting, John, how this whole lockdown and, you know, the loss of income has highlighted these gaps in the industry that perhaps guys that are gigging three, four, five nights a week didn't even think about it before. Now they've had the opportunity to see, you know, when that $250 million package came through, how it really didn't have anything for the ordinary everyday people that actually hold this music industry together. What do you think about that package? Oh, I think it's great for the big end of town. APRA are going to love it, you know, all the publishers and the big promoters especially. Um, all the big touring companies that have staff and PAs and warehouses. And, and that's really important to keep those guys in business. So I fully support it. And I've got to tell you, I'm actually blown out that a Liberal government would have done that. <laughs> um, I'm not anti-Liberal or pro-Labor or the other way around. I'm just pro music, and so I just look at the political parties from the point of view of being a single dad who makes music, you know. Love uh, it. So the 250 million bucks, you know, I mean, as um, um, oh, please help me, Buzz, um, um, the the wonderful singer lady who's an opera singer here in Australia. Oh, Katie Noonan. Oh, she's wonderful. And she was on Q and A, and yes, and, yes. And she said the two two hundred. Fifty or forty million is actually only one hundred and sixty once you take off the loans. Absolutely, That's right. who can possibly borrow money against a pandemic? We don't know when it's going to end. That would be financial suicide. So, yeah, exactly. I don't really think that that's very helpful. But the one hundred and sixty, well, if that helps a few theatre companies, and I think fifty million is put aside for film and television development, mm -hmm. which is great because they're all out of the work, uh, out of work just like we are at the moment. That's right. But as you said, what's in it for the 100,000 musicians in Australia? And the yep. government will go, well, you know, the record companies, APRA, the publishers, and we sort of go, yeah, they sign like five Australian artists a year. I'm talking about 100,000 people. The statistics from um, 
uh, a website called Art Facts, which yes. is run by the Australia Council. And the figures are a bit out of date, but they get their figures, just before I talk numbers, uh, they get their figures from government statistics, including the ATO. Um, and then over the years, um, some of the big companies like Deloitte and Ernst & Young have, done, have been commissioned to do surveys to yeah. assess the, the, our music industry. And um, I thought, I forgot, I forgot where I was going. What was your thing I was answering? So we were, you were talking about the 100,000 people that will miss out on that package. Well, they're the ones we care about. I don't know where I was going with the other rave. <laughs> well, it's, it's Probably interesting. You get 10 things at once, but that, I'm allowed to do that as a proposer. It and people get... our proposers don't necessarily understand that we think like this. So. I know, yeah. And, like, and Buzz and I have been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, that the data source for the funding decisions, where is the holistic data source to understand about the people that are falling between the cracks? The people with the small businesses, with the mortgages, with the families that gig every single week that aren't necessarily doing things with APRA, aren't necessarily used to applying for grants. What happens to them? Well, they're not necessarily liberal voters, you see. <laughs> Interesting. And, and, another, and, and another way of looking at that same little bit of cynicism is that, you know, a lot of people want JobKeeper to continue. Um, I do. Um, and a lot of people are really relying on it. Yeah. And the government has to make the decision of whether to continue it or shut it down, as they suggested in September. And one of the newspapers did a survey and found out that most of the people on JobKeeper are Liberal voters. <laughs> so I feel pretty positive that JobKeeper is going to be great, you know. Um, I feel sceptical that we're ever going to get any of this Australian music plan happening, except it's just a bloody good idea. I, I was telling you before about teaching at Dulwich Hill, and I'm actually sponsored by the Canterbury Hurston Park RSL Club. They sponsor me to teach the kids, and it's a charitable thing. They get to claim it on tax. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and so... Part of our plan is to go to Clubs Australia and invite them to sponsor musicians in every, like the 6,600 um, community, very important word here, not corporate, yeah. Community, yeah. community clubs. Like you can't shut down a club without government permission because it's owned by the community, which is a wonderful thing. A lot of them started out as return servicemen's clubs and they were obviously very focused on the welfare of all of um, the return servicemen, their families, you know, a lot of them came back from the war shell-shocked and for many years that was the tradition of the RSL club, was to bring people together to sort out their problems together and, and, and the clubs through their uh, charitable club grants program, see now I get back to the business, um, <laughs> $80 million a year they collect. All right. Sorry, yes, $80 million a year is spent on club grants. So, for example, my, you know, my local club, the Canterbury Hilson Park, um, I think it's about, you know, it's close to a million bucks a year that they um, hand out to local charitable institutions. And they've set up the Cook River Sports um, Club, which brings in busload after busload of school kids to work with really great sports mentors. Um, and now we want to um, talk to Clubs Australia about maybe putting a percentage of that money towards artistic projects because Beautiful. in the same way that sports is about health and community attitude and all of this sort of competition, well, music's not about competition, I'll just say that right now. Anyone who says it is, all those competition shows on, on television, honestly, uh, I've got to stop talking about them. But, but, um, but uh, apart from that, music offers a lot of the same benefits as sport. It keeps you healthy. It keeps you focused. It's team team effort. It helps you, you know, work. Well, it's mu music is one of the only things which is intergenerational, and and, and you know, and 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 it doesn't matter if you're old, young, boy, girl, man, woman. You can all play music. Yeah, you know? it's the it's the one thing every kid can sing. Yeah, yeah. And what they they somehow forget how that that skill through the self-conscious teenage years, a lot of people. And that's why I really love teaching kids that age. Not only was it the age I was at where I really got the bug, but uh, I'm sort of helping them prolong their 
you know that wonderful creative state kids are in? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. bogged down by practicalities. They can just let their imaginations run. And when kids get to about the age of 10 or 11, that, that, that starts to die away um, for more structured thinking, which is what society yeah. wants. And they've neglected music. In fact, I think a lot of schools have stopped doing music because they think it may interfere with the other subjects because it's not such a disciplined area. However... <laughs> Understood. It's been proven that people who learn music do better in every other subject. That's right. This amazing electrical reaction between your memory and the front of your brain and the left and right, right brain and your emotions and your logical thoughts. And it all comes together when you play one note on a guitar, you know, if you just play one simple beat on a drum kit. And all of those things yeah. that, that make us human just come together and explode in this creativity. So these kids, I'm sort of helping them stay young for the rest of their lives in a way. That's the love way it. I think of it anyway, you know. And that's yeah. what no, music it. should be. Music should be about um, strengthening community. I'm sick of all these ego people who go, I oh, like heavy metal, everyone else is a jerk, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, how does that help anyone, you know? is For him to be able to identify as different, he has to criticise everybody else. I'm pretty yeah. sure buzzers <laughs> like me that we've played all styles of music and I love it all, really, you know. Yeah. Look, uh, there was a great um, there was a great uh, show on ABC last night. Uh, it was um, I think it was called Backroads, uh, but it was about this town in uh, Yorta Yorta country, just up near Shepparton, and it was about uh, I think it was called Gigari, this little town. Anyway, it was it was basically uh, a dairy community. The drought had just had. had you know the the dairy farms were drying out everyone was out of work so they started playing music and they started in this old hall and it's now they've had a festival it's an amazing story I, I, it's a really cool story of just these dairy farmers that started playing music and then they got a guy that came and and um and helped them do a junk orchestra so this made instruments and now they do performances it's a fantastic story oh, but that's exactly wow. what you're talking about john it's what music yeah. does and 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 it's not just it's not not just about the industry because the industry is really only the financial part of it. All yeah. the, all the wonderful things are, are, are not uh, you know monetized. And yet, like most industries, it's run by accountants and lawyers now, and and that's okay, taken well, away well. the essence of what music is supposed to be. And that's like I listen to commercial radio these days and. You know, part of it must be a generational gap. You know, old man yells at cloud. Ah, but um, <laughs> but, but but more than that is 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 commercial radio relies on the major labels to supply them a consistent quality of commercial music, mm -hmm. and they need to um, satisfy uh, their audience. But their audience aren't at the top of the list. The top of the list for commercial radio is the marketing. Um, That's right. So when yeah. BHP wants to advertise or Holden Cars or whatever, they go to marketing people first. Yeah. Marketing people coordinate everything else. Well, right. we would rather that be an association with musicians and that's the point of the Australian Music Plan, you know. Well, John, I think you've, you've issued quite a big call to action today. It's number one, what is the value of music? And number two, you've given a great, a, a holistic scope for people who haven't necessarily looked behind the green curtain, you've given them a great perspective of what it actually is like. And I think that your organisation is a great start for people to start looking at, okay, what other ways can this mechanism come together? What other ways can we run this industry? So, wow, we could talk to you for ages. That was great. John, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I'll make sure I put a link in this post to the group and to the page and I would highly recommend every artist join the group. It is so worthwhile. I've really enjoyed going in there every day and just seeing what all the posts are because it really helps you to get this different perspective about music. Like you said, it's not about the industry. And as Buzz said, it's about this energy exchange, this sensory experience, this you know, in the community of life. So you've, you've, this has been a good news story today, John. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, That's great. great. Yeah, and Buzz, thank you so much for joining the conversation. My and John, as once you submit this, we would like to come back to you and talk about what the responses were, what the results were after you made the submission, because I think there's a lot more to know about this music business plan that you've put together. So from all of us um, around Australia in the independent music scene, 
thank you for taking the time to actually do that. We really appreciate it. Thank you, and I, and I appreciate your, your efforts in helping spread the word, and it is always a pleasure to spend some time with Buzz. Oh, there you go. See you guys. Nice to see everyone. Okay. Cheers. Take care.